It's the middle of the night. A steamship is tearing through the darkness at full speed. But suddenly, something dangerous is spotted up ahead off to the ship's right hand or starboard side. With only seconds to act, the desperate officer of the watch roars out a simple command, hard to starboard. And the helmsman of the ship's wheel begins urgently spinning the big wheel over to the left. But hang on a minute, you might ask. The officer saw the obstacle is off to the right. Why is he calling out to seemingly steer into it by ordering hard to starboard? And then, to confuse matters further, why did the helmsman turn the wheel to port or over to the left? This is all to do with an archaic system of commands which is at the very heart of the story of how ships steer and how they've operated through the centuries. It's actually a really fascinating story, how ships have been able to move themselves and manoeuvre well as they've increased exponentially in size is really remarkable stuff. Today we'll take a look at the history, how through three distinct ages ships have handled themselves differently all the way up to today and the high tech systems that make sure even the most monstrous of floating vessels can turn at all. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Let's answer the question, how do ships turn? We'll come back to our example from the start of the video soon, but first we need to cast our mind's eye way back to the dawn of ocean going exploration. In our earliest days, boats were very simple things and they were naturally rather small. It didn't take a whole lot to turn them. That and we were constrained only to calm waters like lakes and rivers which are quite shallow and calm. Ancient Egyptian carvings and illustrations show boats being propelled with oars and mounted at the after end or the stern of the boat is an oar meant purely for steering. More advanced Egyptian vessels from around the Middle Kingdom featured a pair of the things with dedicated operators turning them left or right, guiding the vessel as it moved through the water. Now the concept is fairly simple. By altering the direction of the steering oar, you're essentially creating drag on one side of the boat, meaning it will turn towards that direction because the flow or the momentum is being interrupted on just that side, thanks to the drag. Now steering oars are really as simple as it gets. They were used on ancient boats on everything from Greek triremes to Roman warships, usually mounted off to one side. But vessels like Viking longboats introduced an addition to the oar. Essentially a handle that could be mounted horizontally across the width of the ship connected directly to the oar, something even simpler for an operator to use. By turning the handle left or right, the steering oar at the end of it would respond. Now this simple little handle would become the basis for a system that would be in use all the way until today. It was called the tiller. By the dawn of the age of sail, that steering oar had been moved to the ship's centerline and placed at the back, given the name rudder from the old English word rodder, meaning paddle or oar. And my apologies to Simon Roper for butchering that pronunciation. But anyway, ships now had rudders and the way to control them was fairly straightforward and it would remain unchanged for a long time yet. In essence, the rudder was still connected to a tiller, but now ships had become so big that you couldn't just put a crewman with his hands at the tiller to control the direction of movement. For one, you need a score of people to handle the thing. In rough weather, the pressure of waves acting against the broad surface of the rudder would throw the tiller this way and that, presenting a clear and obvious danger to anybody unfortunate enough to be standing nearby. Yeah, ouch. The first approach to this issue was the introduction of the whip staff. It was really just a long pole connected to the tiller at the back, a couple of decks below, and secured into place with the tough iron fitting called a gooseneck, which allowed swiveling in place and constrained its movements. So acting as a very simple kind of lever, the whip staff would put the tiller left or right and therefore move the rudder, turning the ship. It was simple but needed a mighty strong helmsman to operate because besides the natural load lessening nature of levers, the tiller needed brute strength to swivel. Still, the whipstaff stayed in service for a surprisingly long time, right up until the 18th century, and it was the control mechanism of choice for ships like the East India Dutchman, Spanish Galleons, and British Elizabethan warships. It wasn't until the early 1700s that wheels would be added into the mix. The introduction of the ship's wheel, or helm, named from the old English noun to helve something, that is to handle a tool or a weapon, absolutely changed the game. Now, wheels could drive the tiller and introduce a kind of gearing. It still needed a lot of strength, but because the wheel was connected through ropes and pulleys, often to a second drum or axle below, which actually pulled on the tiller, 
meant that the system needed less brute force to operate. Often on sailing ships preserved today, you'll see the ship's wheel seemingly pointed backwards, and many people actually pose for photographs standing the wrong way. It's not facing backwards, it's just positioned that way so that two people can stand either side of it to take up the force of actually turning the thing in rough weather. Of course, by 1700 and beyond, ships were becoming bigger and bigger, but the helm and tiller arrangement stayed in operation for a very long time indeed, and virtually unchanged at that. The thing is, the wheel, connected with ropes and pulleys, needed to be positioned directly above the tiller. And it could still be a dangerous job. In heavy seas or a storm, the wheel could get away from the helmsman and spin freely at extreme speed. It was known to kill. In fact, a crewman aboard the SS Great Eastern was killed in the latter 1800s because the ship's wheel backspun out of control and clipped him. Ship's wheels became bigger and bigger because not unlike the wheels on a penny farthing or the gears of a bicycle, a bigger wheel requires less movement to turn the tiller further. It was a clever, simple system which remained unchanged until the days of steam. And even then, things only changed slightly with the introduction of machinery designed to lessen the workload on the crew. By Titanic's day, believe it or not, ships still used tillers. But the mechanics involved and the sheer scale of the machinery is astounding. Titanic's rudder alone stood the height of a seven-story building and weighed over 100 tons. Not only that, but the ship that rudder needed to turn weighed itself over 50,000 tons. Now obviously, human brute force just wasn't going to cut it. Fortunately, there'd been some pretty serious mechanical inventions that helped a lot. Instead of human power turning the rudder, Titanic and other steamships just like her had her tiller connected to a set of steam engines. Now these were basically miniature versions of the kind you'd expect to see actually powering the ship down in the engine rooms. They sat inside a special compartment directly above the rudder in the same way the ship's wheel had once been positioned back in the days of sail. The steering engines were geared directly to a huge quadrant-like tiller which was attached directly to the rudder's stock or its central axis. Running the engines, fed of course by high pressure steam, in one direction would turn the gears, the tiller and therefore the rudder below. But the ship's main wheel couldn't be mounted that far back at the stern. Ships by that point were nearing a thousand feet in length, and the bridge was well far forward. So instead, a machine called a telemotor was devised which controlled the steam engines that were so far away. The telemotor was an early type of servo motor and it employed a cylinder in the wheelhouse and a matching cylinder all the way back at the steering engine. Connecting them were hydraulic lines with fluid, about 70% water and 30% glycerin to prevent freezing, Turning the ship's wheel would push the cylinder at the wheel on the bridge over, forcing liquid through the pressurised pipes and pushing the corresponding cylinder at the other end of the ship, which was connected to the steering engine. Now, springs inside the telemotor cylinder would give feedback to the helmsman, meaning that as the turn became tighter, it would just require more force to turn the ship's wheel. If the helmsman released the wheel, the springs would return the ship's wheel to a neutral position and the cylinders would return to a midships. Now all of this would engage the ship's steering engines so that turning the wheel would activate the engines, turning the quadrant, and then the tiller. Now because of this brilliant system, one man could turn a 100 ton rudder with relative ease. So let's for a minute go back to our example at the start of this video. When Titanic approached the iceberg, First Officer William Murdoch ordered hard to starboard, which would make it sound like he was ordering a turn to the right into the iceberg. But the archaic way of calling out steering orders from the time meant that Murdoch was ordering the helmsman at the wheel to put Titanic's tiller to starboard on the right hand side. Now this would, of course, turn the ship's rudder in the opposite direction, to the left. By ordering the tiller hard over to starboard, Murdoch was actually ordering an emergency turn to port. So the helmsman turned the wheel to the left as fast as he could, the telemotor drove the steering engines at speed and they jammed the quadrant tiller to the right to starboard. Titanic's massive 100 plus ton rudder swung to the left, but of course it was too late. This system became the norm for all big passenger and warships. In fact, those destined for use in combat made use of a series of emergency steering positions deep within the hull. For example, Lusitania, which had been secretly designed as a merchant cruiser and might end up in a gun battle, had a special steering position in the steering engine room itself, very near to the waterline. Emergency steering compartments were extremely important so that if the bridge was hit and the main wheel was destroyed, there was at least one other position where the ship could be controlled. 
and since the wheel there was geared directly to the steering engines themselves, there would be no need to worry about hydraulic pressure or any of the lines getting hit. Now, you might be surprised to know that many big ships today still use tillers. Even if the ship has more than one rudder, a pair of tillers can be connected to something called a tie rod, which turns them both together in the same direction. Today, steering gears are mostly hydraulic, relying on pressurised oil lines and motorised pumps to respond to helm commands and push cylinders either side of the tiller, thus turning the rudder. Telemotors are still in use, but the signals they transfer back to the steering gear can be hydraulic or electric. The telemotor typically communicates with a receiver, which engages the hydraulic system and turns the tiller whichever way it needs to go. Modern control systems are split into specific sections. For one, the bridge control equipment, including the actual machinery needed to receive instructions from the bridge, like transmitters, hydraulic lines, and so on. Then there's the power unit, the main source of power to the rudder itself, like the pumps, the electric motors, and so on. Finally, the transmission unit, converting the signals from the bridge into actual mechanical movement of the rudder. Today, working in among the whole system is something called the hunting gear, a system devised to arrest the rudder's movement once the required change in direction or angle has been achieved. It effectively communicates the position of the rudder to the pump control and prevents over-positioning of the rudder, keeping it in position until the next input is made. The system is today actually quite complex and relies on a host of control rods, floating levers, power units, and more, so please excuse this rather rudimentary explanation, but the point is that rudder tiller telemotor system has been perfected very well indeed. Now, there are a few more systems used by ships today. Two of the most impressive use screws or propellers. Bow thrusters became a must-have for all big ships when they were first introduced in the 50s and 60s. This clever system relied on one or more impellers, basically propellers mounted sideways, inside the bow with ports that could allow the bladed impeller to turn either direction, thus providing thrust to the ship's bow. Today, most, if not all, big cruise ships use bow thrusters, and they're crucial in docking and manoeuvring in tight spaces. Being able to swing your bow around under your own power without the use of tugs is a huge deal, and makes actually moving ships in excess of 100,000 tons or more significantly easier. Because back in the old days, the ship's bow could swing wildly away, with no way to arrest it, without having like half a dozen tugs or more on standby. Probably the most revolutionary step forward in manoeuvring ships has been the Azipod, which does away with tillers and rudders entirely. This clever system uses massive pods slung below the ship's stern. They serve two purposes, mainly acting as the ship's main propulsion system. Pointing directly ahead, the thrust will drive the ship along like usual, but the pods can swivel in place, and even a slight change in their direction will alter the ship's course in the same way that a rudder would. They're powered by diesel generators from above, which produce monumental amounts of electricity to power motors inside. Those fitted to the Queen Mary II, for example, can rotate a full 360 degrees thanks to hydraulic steering motors mounted above, but each pod weighs as much as a Boeing 747 jumbo jet, and the motors inside have an incredible 21.5 megawatt output. That's a lot of raw power potential. So that's how it's done. Incredibly, aside from the introduction of hydraulics and pumps, things like that, and azipods, the rudder tiller system is strikingly similar today to what preceded it way back in the 1300s with the whipstaff. The principles are still largely the same. What has absolutely changed is the sheer size of ships. It really boggles my mind when I see just how enormous these things are. For example, the upcoming Disney Adventure, which was just floated out, has a hull of about 208,000 gross tons, which is enough space for over 8,100 people. To turn, she'll need three azipod thrusters. What an absolute monster of a thing. You can't quite imagine one poor bloke at the back absolutely straining on a steering oar to turn it. So it's a good thing that technology's got us to where we are today. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.